2 Kings 13. So the book of 2 Kings, it's a lot of, at least the last several weeks, it's covered a lot of Elisha's ministry. We learn a lot about some of Israel's kings and how disappointing they are, (laughs) the potential they have being part of God's plan, and yet one after the other seems to just want to go his own way and not lead the people as they need to be led and as they deserve to be led by a representative of God's people. And so we really do see in this book just the importance of having godly leaders and godly people in our lives. As we're going to see in this chapter, the negative and evil leadership and influence of their king leads them to God allowing judgment to come upon them in the form of captivity to the Syrians. We just look at that. We see that Uh, over and over again throughout the book of second kings and so uh just let that be kind of a lesson to us to be praying for our leaders both in our nation and in our state and city and but also in our church that we need good godly people to lead the way and to be a godly influence on our lives so we're going to go through the whole chapter today and uh, i'm going to you're the type that likes to follow along in the app with the notes i'm going to just cheat and give you all the answers right now Because in this chapter, as I was studying through it and reading, there were three things that stood out to me that the Lord revealed himself through, that he revealed a little bit about who he is and how he operates through these stories in this chapter. And so the first one that stood out to me is one, that God listens, that the Bible tells us not only in this story, but all over the place, that God, his ear is inclined to hear you. He wants to hear from you. And so the first thing that God is going to reveal to us in these stories is that he's listening. The second thing that stood out to me in this passage is that God invites you and I to participate in his plan in our lives. He invites us to be part of what he's doing in our lives and in the lives of other people. He doesn't just want to do everything all by himself. He wants us to play a part and play a role. And it then falls to us to be faithful and diligent to fulfill our role in God's plan. And then the last thing that I noticed in this that God reveals about himself is that he keeps his promises. That if God says he'll do something, he'll do it without fail. And sometimes we're confused by that because we mistake his patience and his long suffering and his timing as failure because we don't see him working in the time frame we expect or desire him to. And we'll see in this chapter that he works kind of in an immediate sense, but then he also works in a delayed sense. And that's the way God is. It's up to him and he decides. But what we can rest assured in is that he will keep his promises. And so those are the three things to me that these stories highlight about our Lord. So let's go ahead and get started. In verse 1, it says, In the 23rd year of uh, Joash, the son of Ahaziah, the king of Judah, Jehoiahaz, the son of Jehu, became king over Israel in Samaria and reigned 17 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. He did not depart from them. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he delivered them into the hand of Haziel, king of Syria. And into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel, all their days. So Jehoahaz pleaded with the Lord, and the Lord listened to him. For he saw the oppression of Israel, because the king of Syria oppressed them. Then the Lord gave Israel a deliverer, so that they could escape from under the hand of the Syrians. And the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before. Nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who had made Israel sin. But walked in them, and the wood images also remained in Samaria. For he left of the army of Jehoiahaz only fifteen horsemen, ten chariots, and ten thousand foot soldiers. For the king of Syria had destroyed them and made them like the dust at threshing. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiahaz, all that he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Jehoiahaz rested with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria, Then Joash, his son, reigned in his place. So in the first nine verses of this chapter, we kind of get just the brief overall message of Jehoiahaz's life. Notably, this one instant when the Syrians came in and took them captive. We're told that Jehoiahaz was evil. 
that he was, it says in verse 2, that he did evil in the sight of the Lord by following the sins of Jeroboam. Now, that is a very common phrase in the book here, Second Kings. Many of the kings are cited as kind of following in this type of evil. And I'm sure that Troy's mentioned this before, but just by way of reminder, I want to just be reminded of what does it mean when it says that he followed in the sins of Jeroboam? You know, Jeroboam had made the nation to sin. And what does that mean? So to kind of get that story, of course, you have to go back to 1 Kings chapter 12, or you see the story of the nation of Israel splitting into two parts. After Solomon died, his son Rehoboam took over and made some bad policy decisions. He was had a desire to be seen as stern and tough and made some decisions that led to many of the tribes seceding. And they created their own nation uh, in the north called Israel. And the remaining tribes in the south were called Judah. The problem with this is that even though they separated and became two separate nations, they were still all Jews. And here's the thing. Jews worship Yahweh. They worship God. And they worship God in Jerusalem. In the temple. And so for the northern kingdom who didn't have Jerusalem, nor did they have the temple, that created a problem. Now what we learn in in 1 Kings chapter 12 is Jeroboam, it says in verses 26 through 27, Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So Jeroboam had a problem. And the problem was the people of Israel were still Jews. And they were still going to want to worship. And that would necessitate them traveling to Jerusalem, into Judah, to the temple to worship. And Jeroboam feared that in so doing, their hearts would be turned back to the nation and and want to reunify in which case he's a goner all right his power is gone he feared for even his life and so what jeroboam did and i'll read it to you um because it's interesting uh it's there in second kings 12 verses 28 through 33 it says therefore the king asked advice made two calves of gold and said to the people it is too much for you to go up to jerusalem Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. This thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. And he made shrines on the high places. He made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did in Bethel sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel, he installed the priests of the high places, which he had made. And so he offered on the altar, which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. To address this problem that Jeroboam had, his solution was, We'll just create our own version of worshiping Yahweh. And he did, you might have recognized what Aaron and the others did while Moses was up on the mountain receiving the law. They fashioned a gold calf and said, this is your God who brought you out of Israel. So they're trying to maintain the worship of the correct God, but he's devised a a false way of worshiping God. If you were listening and and it stood out to you, you might have noticed it kept saying, which he made, which he made, which he made, what he devised in his own heart. So Jeroboam, in a cynical attempt to retain his own power, changed the worship of God in Israel and for political reasons, influenced the way that the people would worship. Now, obviously that is extremely wicked. It's very cynical and it's insincere. But it is, more than anything, very bad leadership. He's leading these people, as we read throughout the book of Second Kings, into sin. It says they walked in those sins of Jeroboam. You know, and I would also kind of humbly just advise you to be cautious in your own life. When you start to see someone for political reasons or people who are trying to have or hold on to some sort of power begin to 
take that religious approach, make sure that it's not cynical and that it's not being changed in some way. We see this happen in our country from the left and from the right, where people are trying to use God and trying to manipulate God's people into supporting them. And so we have to be on guard. We see the effect that it had on the nation of Israel. We have to be on guard that doesn't happen in our lives, in our church, and in our country. And so we see this cynical approach to religion, this political approach to religion that we see in Jeroboam. We're told here in chapter 13 of 2 Kings that this angered God. Notice what it says in verse 3. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he delivered them into the hand of Haziel, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel, all their days. So God rightfully is angry at their continuance of this sin. He is upset with this because, it one, it breaks a couple of the Ten Commandments right out of the gate. We're told in the Ten Commandments right off the bat not to create engraved images to worship. We don't do that. God has prohibited that. Secondly, Jeroboam had rejected the place of God's worship, the the place that God had ordained for worship to take place there in Jerusalem in the temple. He had rejected God's choice of who would be the priests in that worship system. And also, it was clearly an insincere attempt to worship. God had ordained a way for them to worship, and they had rejected it. For in his case, in Jeroboam's case, it was for political expediency, but also for the nation, it became much more convenient to worship these golden calves in a town near their home rather than making the trip to Jerusalem. And so it becomes this thing that we often will do on our lives. We may not realize we're doing it, but we take what God has said and we rewrite them to coincide with our conveniences or preferences. We will justify things that we're doing that we know are contrary to God's word because, well, they make financial sense or they make this part of my life easier or this or that, or they're more acceptable in my community. And we will compromise the things of God and try to call them Christianity, but they're not. And they're not any more Christian than this form of worship was Jewish. We maintain the same God But we're trying to worship him in our own way. We're trying to form God around our image rather than allowing God to conform us to the image of Christ. And we must be on guard against this continually. And so we see the nation of Israel continuing on in this sin. So the Lord is angry. Verse 3, it says that he allowed them to be delivered into the hands of Haziel, the king of Syria. The Lord reacted and responded in judgment to this sin. And God, in the lives of his people, will always seek to correct them when they stray from the truth. When we wander from the truth, God will chastise and correct his people. What we'll see is that his intent isn't to destroy them, but to correct them. And so God, in his anger to this sin, allows them to fall into the hands of the Syrians. Now, something interesting happens here in verse 4. It says that Jehoiahaz pleaded with the Lord, and notice, and the Lord listened to him. Here, the people have fallen into captivity to the Syrians, and the king, this evil king, this king who followed in the footsteps of Jeroboam, who really religion was just a way to exercise power, finds himself all of a sudden in need of God's help. And so it says that he pleaded with God. Now in English, the word plead is pretty strong already. When you picture someone who's pleading, you might even picture someone on their knees. Please do this for me. Please. They're pleading with you. In the Hebrew, the word could also be used to describe someone who is weak or wounded or grieving. Someone who's in a place of just brokenness. And so what we see here is Jehoiahaz, in this moment in his life, probably was just a moment, but finds himself humbled and in need before God. And it says, and we're told that he pleaded with God. So he, in a way, accidentally approached God in the right way. And he had spent his whole life trying to approach God through the wrong way, through pride and arrogance, that we can change God's 
form of worship ourselves, but now all of a sudden he's in need and he comes to God in the right way. And the right way is in humility and with a brokenness. The Bible tells us that God loves a broken and contrite heart, that God responds to someone who's humbled before him. Not only has he stumbled upon that, he's also found himself in a place of being in agreement with God's will. The thing that he's praying about is something that is part of God's plan. And we know that when we are praying in accordance with God's will, He hears us. So Jehoiahaz has found himself in this unique place where all of a sudden he is humbled and praying in the will of God. And look at what it says there. It says, and the Lord listened to him. Jehoiahaz was far from perfect. He was far from being an ideal follower of God. And yet, even then, when he humbled his heart and prayed in accordance with God's will, God heard him. And that encourages me because what that tells me is God is listening. He's ready to hear what we might have to say as we come to him in humility. In Psalm 138 verse 6, it says, Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. And so we know from scriptures that if we'll humble ourselves before God, he'll hear us. We also know that when we pray in accordance with his will, he will answer us. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 through 15, it says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we asked of him. And so God has made this wonderful promise, and he's, made, he's revealed this to us this morning. He's saying to us, I am listening. And if you will humble your heart and come to me and seek my will, I will hear you. And I will execute my will in your life. I will do the work that you are needing in your life. I will do it. And I will hear you and I will respond. God is listening to us. And that is such a wonderful thing. Now think about this also. This also stood out to me when I was kind of reading through this passage and thinking about how interesting it was that God listened to his prayer and thinking how much more is he willing to hear the prayers of those who are seeking to follow him right? Those who, none of us are perfect and all of us are far from ideal, but how much more is he willing to hear those who are seeking after him, right? And so we have this message from the Lord this morning that that he is listening. The Bible tells us that his ear is open to the cry of the righteous. His eye is upon them, right? And God is interested in hearing about what we have to say. He's interested in allowing us to come into that place of being changed by him. You know, I grew up in church. I, my parents uh, became Christian when I was just three years old. So, I mean, I've pretty much been in church my whole life. And more than one time, as I was coming up as a Christian, I thought, well, what's the point? You know, the Bible says God knows the things that you need before you ask. So obviously the, the, the question is, well, well, then why? Why do I have to even ask if God knows? And one of the things that I've learned by experience in having prayer be a part of my life is that One of the things that God does through that time where we're praying and spending time with him is that in those times, he has transformed my will to coincide with his will. It's more than once I've been praying for something. And when I started praying, I had a selfish motivation. I had a way that I thought it should go. And in time and through prayer, God had revealed to me that his plan was different than mine and he was going to do it this way. And my prayers began to conform to his will. And it was at that point that I began to see his answers take place in my life. The time we spend in prayer to the Lord is time that we have to learn from him, to hear from him, to let him guide our hearts into submission to his will for us. And so we know that God is listening. And if we'll come to him in humility, seeking his will, he will answer us. Isn't that wonderful? So God heard, he listened to Jehoiahaz. Now notice there in verse 4 why he was willing to listen to Jehoiahaz. It says, For he saw the oppression of Israel because the king of Assyria oppressed them. It wasn't just that Jehoiahaz wanted something. It was that Jehoiahaz wanted something that was the same as what God wanted. And so God heard that prayer and he moved in compassion on the people just as Jehoiahaz was pleading for him to do. So it says in verse 5, Then the Lord gave Israel a deliverer 
so that they escaped from under the hand of the Syrians and the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before. Now, Jehoiahaz was praying for deliverance. God, in this immediate sense, gave a partial deliverance. He didn't give them complete deliverance from the Syrians. That would come much later, many years later, but it would come. And God began to act at response to the prayer of Jehoiahaz and according to his own will. But he didn't give complete deliverance at that time. Verse 6 will give us an insight as to why he chose to do it this way. Notice it says, Nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who had made Israel sin, but they walked in them. And the wooden images also remained in Samaria. So God in compassion lightened their oppression. They were able to dwell in their own homes, but they were still subject to Syria. And they, of course, they were paying tribute to them that whole time. And so God gave a partial deliverance and he in time would give a complete deliverance. So verse eight says, now the rest of the acts of Jehoiahaz, all that he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And so the writer of uh, second Kings is saying, if you want to know more, you got to go over to Chronicles and check it out. (laughs) So for more in-depth analysis, go over to, to Chronicles. So verse nine says, so Jehoiahaz rested with his fathers and they buried him in Samaria. Then Joash, his son reigned in his place. So the first thing that we saw in chapter 13 is God is listening. Next, we're going to see that God invites us to participate. Before we get there, let's look at verses 10 through 13. It says, In the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, the son of Jehoiaz, became king over Israel in Samaria and reigned 16 years. And guess what? He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam and the son of the son of Nabat, who made Israel sin, but he walked in them. Now the rest of the acts of Joash, all that he did, and his might, which he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Joash rested with his fathers, and Jeroboam sat on his throne, and Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. So we get kind of a brief overall view of the life of this next king, Joash. In the remainder of the chapter, we'll see God responding to Joash as well. But we get a kind of a a thumbnail view of his life. Really, at least in this account, the big highlight, of course, is that he fought with his own brethren, right? He fought with the king of Judah. That's not great. (laughs) That's one of the highlights of his life that he would fight with his own people, right? And so now Joash is king. Just kind of as a side note, notice again, we see this repetition of the same sins. And maybe you've experienced in your life or you know someone who has where there seems to be like this generational continuance of certain sins in a family, right? Whether it be alcoholism or abuse or, you know, whatever. They seem to kind of just continue down this same family line. And these kids will grow up in this type of lifestyle where they're being abused or they're living in an alcoholic home or or something else. And then against all reason, they fall right into the same patterns. And you might think to yourself, how could you not see that you need to change? But it's just evidence of the brokenness of human beings, isn't it? And it just shows us just how broken we are, that we can continue in the sins of those who've come before us. But you know, even on a bigger scale, the nation of Israel, the people have done this in their culture and in their society. They just continue down the same path of destruction. And as Christians, we have to be different. We cannot look at our society and our culture and say, well, that's good enough. Because as you know, there are many things in our culture and in our society that are contrary to what God says. And as Christians, we have to stand against those things. We have to reject them in our lives. We have to reject them from finding their way into our churches. We have to remain faithful to the word of God. And if it means that we have to break that cycle of sin, then we have to seek the Lord to do so. God help us not to follow in the footsteps of those who have led us in the wrong direction. So let's continue on. Verse 14, we'll read down to verse 21. It says, Elisha had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. And Elisha said to him, take up a bow and some arrows And so he took himself a bow and some arrows. And then he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. And so he put his hand on it 
And Elisha put his hand on the king's hands, and he said, Open the east window. And he opened it. And then Elisha said, Shoot! And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you have destroyed them. And then he said, Take the arrows. And so he took them, and he said to the king of Israel, Strike the ground. And so he struck three times and stopped. The man of God was angry and with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you have destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. Then Elisha died and they buried him. And the raiding bands from Moab invaded the land in the spring of the year. And so it was as they were burying a man that suddenly they spied a band of raiders And they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. So that's kind of a weird little ending to that section. We'll talk about that in a minute. So this section starts with this bad news. And the bad news is that Elisha becomes sick with the illness that's going to kill him. And, you know, I find this interesting because a lot of us Christians, we have this notion we get it somewhere, I'm not sure, but we get this idea that if I'm following the Lord and I'm trying to live by faith and, and just be as faithful to God's commandments, that everything's going to be okay. And then when it turns out that things don't end up okay, we think, what's your problem, God? How come you're letting me down? Or we think there's something wrong with me, right? And God is punishing me. But here's the thing. In Israel, Elisha, he was probably like, the most righteous dude in the, in the place. And yet we read Elisha became sick with the illness of which he would die. Sometime we have to get away from this idea that everything's going to be okay all the time. Because you want to know something that doesn't come from the Bible. Jesus himself promised that we would suffer. He said in the world, you will have tribulation. He, it's a guarantee. He said, you will. That's what the word will means. It's not like you might, you could, no, you will have tribulation. And so we know from the teachings of Christ and other places in the scriptures that in this life, we will suffer, we will have trials, we will have tribulations, we will enter into dark times in our lives. But here's the good news, and Jesus continued his statement by saying, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And his promise to us is, hey, you will face persecution, you'll face tribulation, you'll face hard times, but don't worry, I am with you and I have overcome all of these things. God is promising to get us through them. But let's get this notion out of our heads that if something bad happens to me, that God has let me down. God has never promised that everything's going to work out, but he has promised that it will work out in the end, right? He said in the book of Romans, he said, for we know that all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose, right? And so we know that we will have times of suffering, but we also know that God has overcome anything that we face, even death. And so Elisha, a godly man, gets sick with the illness with which he will die. Upon hearing this news, Joash is distraught. Verse 14, it says, Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him, wept over his face, and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. Does anybody remember where they've heard that before? Wasn't it at the moment that Elijah was caught up into heaven with the whirlwind? And Elisha, recognizing how devastating this was for the nation, said, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. This was a recognition from Elisha that the strength of that nation was the presence of a godly man. And now that godly man was being taken away. And the same thing is now being said, and God has worked through Elisha in the nation of Israel so powerfully that this wicked king would come to him distraught under and realizing the one good thing that we have as a nation is being taken away. The strength of our nation, the man through whom God is working among us is being taken away. And in that we see the influence that Elisha had among those people. And I would encourage you to understand that wherever you find yourself, you are a man or woman of God. In those places, you are the strength of that moment because you are the one through whom God is working. He's going to bring his wisdom through you. He's going to bring his power through you. Maybe you can can relate to this. You have a job or you're in a workplace, mostly non-believers. Something goes wrong in their lives. What do they do? They come to you and ask you to pray. They don't pray, but they want you to pray because they know that in you dwells God. They see him working in your life. 
They see it with their own two eyes, and they know that this is a person in whom God is working, and I need his work. At that point, they don't know enough to just turn to him themselves. And so our influence is able to lead them to the Lord. Jesus said that we're a city on a hill. Imagine if you're wandering in the wilderness, you're lost, and you look up and there's a hill, and there's a city on top. Uh, Praise God, you're saved. All you have to do now is go to the city, because in the city is provision and orderliness and law and order. And all the things that you're going to need to survive are in that city. Jesus said, that is you and me in the world around us. We're the hope of the world. He says, we're the light of the world. And so we bring his light. And so Elisha, his passing is have a devastating impact on the nation. And even the king understands that this is not good. They're in subjugation to Syria. They have no power. Remember from the previous section there in the first nine verses, they've been left weak. They have Very few horsemen, chariots, a small army. They're weak. And now the only thing that promised any kind of strength and stability, God working through Elisha now was going away. And so Elisha responds to Joash in verse 15. He says, take a bow and some arrows. And so he obeyed. He took the bows and arrows. And he said to the king, put your hand on the bow. And so he put his hand on it. And at that point, it says that Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. And we'll see that meant something. And so It says, then he said in verse 17, open the east window. Syria was to the east. He opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And so listen to what Elisha said. The arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. So Elisha communicates to him the meaning of this exercise. He says, that arrow represents you striking Syria and destroying them. And so now all of a sudden we understand, okay, so... This imagery of the arrow going out the window is an image of God striking the nation of Assyria through Israel. So now pay attention to what happens. It says, verse 18, it says, now he tells him, take the arrows. And so he took them and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. And so he struck three times and stopped. Now, every time I've read this, I always imagine him just taking some arrows and striking the ground. But as I was reading through some commentaries, they were kind of saying the meaning more is likely is that he was shooting out the window. Of course, the arrows are striking the ground. And so he's mimicking what he'd already just done. And so the symbol of striking Syria, he's asking him to repeat it. And so what does Joash do? He fires three arrows out the window and then quits. Elisha gets upset. Verse 19 says, and the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck out five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it, but now you will strike Syria only three times. Notice what's happening here. Elisha is communicating to Joash. He's saying, God wants to work through you. God wants you to partner with him to destroy Syria. And so he's asking you to participate. So shoot those arrows out the window. And Joash shoots one, he shoots two, he shoots three, thinks to himself, this is silly. And he stops. And Elisha is upset. He's saying, you know, your half-hearted approach to what God wants to do is going to leave you missing out on the fullness of what God wants to do in your life. See, the thing is, God will invite us to participate in the work that he wants to do in our lives. And he'll do all that he's able to do. And the question will be, will we do the part that we're able to do? How much are we willing to step out and do acts of faith to participate in what God wants to do? You know, it occurred to me that Throughout the ministry of Elisha, many of his miracles that God performed through him required some form of participation from the person being blessed by the miracle. From Second Kings 6, the man lost the axe head and it fell into the river. And Elisha, God through Elisha, caused that axe head to float to the surface. And the man had to go out into the water to grab it. Now, how hard would it have been for the Lord to just cause it to float to the shore? I mean, he's making it flow already, but God required the man to do an act of faith. In 2 Kings 5, Naaman was instructed to go and wash in the river seven times. He was expecting the the prophet to come out and wave his hands and do something cool and just be healed. But God said, no, 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 I want you to participate in your own miracle. And so he, because of some good counsel, he went out and he dipped the seven times. And after the seventh, he was cleansed. In 2 Kings 4, a hundred men were fed when somebody said, hey, we have all these people, but I only have or 20 loaves. And Elisha said, well, give it to him. And the man said, well, what good is 20 loaves among so many people? He said, just give it to him. And he gave it to him and everybody 
had enough. Second Kings 4, the widow was in debt. She was in dire need. Elisha said, gather jars and take the, the one jar of oil that you have and pour it into all of them. And as many jars as she had, she filled with that one jar of oil. And it didn't run out until she filled that last jar. And so presumably, if she would have got more jars, she would have had more oil. Or if she had less jars, she would have had less oil. God was willing to do 100% of what he was able to do. And what she was able to participate when was the, the measurement of the blessings that she received. In Second Kings 3... The kings of Israel and, and Judah got together to go attack their enemies. They got up into the wilderness and realized there's no water up here. They were going to die of thirst, their whole army. And they cried out to the Lord and Elisha told them, go out and dig a bunch of ditches. And so instead of saying, well, that's crazy, they went out and dug ditches. And the Lord sent a flash flood and filled every ditch that they dug. Now, presumably, if they would have dug more ditches, they would have had more water. If they would have dug less ditches, they would have had less water. As much as they were willing to participate in the work of God in their lives, he was willing to meet them at that place. And God invites you and me to participate in what he's doing. He says, be a part of my plan for your life. And so Elisha is upset with the man for not having a wholehearted, enthusiastic approach to the work that God wanted him to do. Had he struck the ground five or six times, he would have had complete victory over Syria. They would have ceased to be a problem. But now, because of his unwillingness to participate wholeheartedly, they would remain and possibly plague them again. And so oftentimes we settle for so much less than what God is willing to do in our lives because we want to compromise with the world or it's just too hard or one of a million reasons. But God wants to do so many things in our life. And really the only thing that limits us experiencing what the New Testament calls the riches of the glory of Christ is our own willingness to participate in being part of what God is doing, taking those steps and acts of faith as God leads us. So we're told there in verse 20 that Elisha died and they buried him. And we get this real brief little story about how at that time Moab began to raid Israel. And so they were out, there was some people out burying somebody when they noticed a group of raiders coming and they just basically shoved him into the first grave they could find to get out of there. And it happened to be Elisha's. And when he touched the bones of Elisha, he rose and stood up on his feet. Now that's an odd little story. And it's like, that's a completely unnecessary thing to happen. But notice again, as we were talking about how the impact that God's people can have on a place, Elisha is dead and gone. And yet his legacy is continuing and God is continuing to honor the ministry of Elisha among the people. Don't sell your impact on the the people around you short. God can do so much more through you than you could even imagine. So let's finish up. Verses 22 through 25. And Haziel, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the day of Jehoiahaz, but the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion on them and regarded them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and would not yet destroy them or cast them from his presence. Now Haziel, king of Syria, died. Then Ben-Hadad, his son, reigned in his place. Then Joash, the son of Jehoiahaz, recaptured the land from the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel, the cities which he had taken out of the hand of Jehoiahaz, his father, by war. Three times Joash defeated him and recaptured the cities of Israel. So here in these last few verses, we see this third thing that God reveals about himself, and that is he keeps his promises. Notice it says in the first two verses of that section, 22 and 23, it says that he had compassion on the people, really not because of their state. They hadn't earned that compassion. They were still in sin, but God had compassion on them because of his promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. He had made a promise to them that this nation would remain. And as long as God is able to keep his promises, that nation would remain. These people would remain. And so God kept his promise. He kept his promise to Joash to defeat them those three times that he was willing to participate. God is a God who keeps his promises. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, the writer of Hebrews says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. He's saying to us, we can have confidence in our faith because God who makes the promises is faithful to keep his promises. Our faith isn't We're not called to live a faith of complete blindness, but our faith is meant to be built upon the experience of seeing God be faithful 
to keep his promises. And anyone who's walked with Jesus for a long time can probably look back on many occasions where God has come through, where God has been faithful. And your faith now is stronger than when you first began. Not because you just are stronger in faith, but because you have a bedrock of experience of God's faithfulness. And so your faith and your confidence in your faith is stronger And we have this assurance from the Lord that he who promises is faithful. God said that his word never returns to him void. It always accomplishes the purpose that he sets it out with. God is a keeper of his word. We'll go back over these three things we learned. First, the Lord is listening. The Lord heard the pleading prayers of Jehoiahaz. As undeserving and imperfect as that man was, he came to God in humility and in agreement with God's will, and God heard him. God, his ear is open to your cry today. He wants to hear from you. He's not put off by what you count as unfaithfulness. His response to you is based on his faithfulness. He hears you this morning if you cry out to him. He promises that if you'll conform yourself to his will, you will begin to experience his will in your life. Secondly, God invites us to participate in our own sanctification, in our own lives, in the plan that he has for us. He invites us to take steps of faith. And lastly, he promises to keep his promises if we'll take those steps of faith. If we will step out in faith, he will not fail. And you can go away with stronger confidence in your own faith. God wants to work, so let's participate. Let's cry out to him. Let's take steps of faith and experience his work in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for these things that you reveal to us about your willingness to be part of our lives. And Lord, we see you working in the lives of men who are not deserving. And Lord, we also realize that we are not always deserving. We are imperfect. We are frail. We are weak. We are broken. We often will be unfaithful, but we praise God that you are faithful. And so, Lord, help us to walk with you in confidence, knowing that if we'll cry out to you, you'll hear us. That if we'll participate in the things that you've set before us, we'll take those steps of faith. You will bless those steps of faith. And, Lord, you will always do what you say you're going to do. We thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness in our lives. Help us to walk with you. Help us to be faithful in return. In Jesus' name. Amen.